Good morning on a rainy day in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and welcome to the gym where we get to do church together as this little sliver of the body of Christ. Wasn't that baptism awesome? Uh, <laughs> that'll preach. Uh, today's story is from 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you have a Bible or a Bible app and you want to turn there and start kind of reading ahead, you can. It's a really cool kind of standalone story, but in order to understand the story, you've got to go back, and I'm going to lay a foundation for it. I'll just go ahead and tell you, it's about David. Uh, we finally got David on the throne. Those of you that have been following us through 1 Samuel, we've been moving really fast through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. It's been a challenge to preach 10 sat- chapters of 1 Samuel, like I did two weeks ago, but fortunately, I don't have to do that today. And, and David's on the throne now. And uh, he's kind of fought off the Philistines. He's kind of fought off the remnants of Saul's family, and he's established his kingdom. And he wants to show, and the Hebrew word is hased. It's the Old Testament word for grace. He wants to show extreme kindness and gracious generosity to some descendant of Saul that's left. And so he finds Jonathan, his old best friend who's dead now, He finds his disabled son, Mephibosheth. I'll probably blow that a few times. Uh, His name literally means broken shame. We'll look at why in just a few minutes. It it could be a name that was given him. It was certainly not his birth name. It was given later in life. Could have been even attributed by the writers, meaning that his shame was broken. More likely it refers to his brokenness physically as being shameful because that was a cultural thing back then. But in any event, David invites Mephibosheth to feast daily with him at his table. He adopts him like a son. And he bestows blessing and honor and privilege on him the rest of his life. Thus, the application question for this morning, if you'll recall that every week in this series we'll come up with a question to consider as the teacher went through the text. The application question for this morning is, Will you come to the table? There is a standing invitation by God to come daily to the table of grace and mercy that he sets for you and I. Every morning when I get up, will I embrace the grace of God and commune with him at his table and then extend that grace to others around me? Before we get to the story, though, let's review and set the stage for it. I'm going to do a timeline. And and I've read... I don't know, half a dozen or more commentaries the last two weeks about the passage, so I stole this from people that have a lot more Bible knowledge and a lot more degrees behind their name in Bible than I do. And, and admittedly, no one knows for sure exactly the date that these things happen, but this is real close. So let's assign the date 1100 B.C., maybe about 1090 B.C., to be a little more accurate, to the birth of Samuel. That's where we started with the story. And Samuel's going to be kind of the key spiritual figure in Israel for the next 70, 80, 90, maybe even 100 years. Even as a young boy, he starts getting elevated, that role of prophet and priest, because God speaks audibly to him, and he speaks regularly to him, and he transfers what God is saying to those that God wants told, mainly the nation of Israel. Then in about 1050 B.C., with Samuel still alive, God tells him to go find this guy named Saul and appoint him king. Now, this wasn't God's idea. In fact, God didn't really want to do this, but he reluctantly went along with the nation of Israel's demand that they have a king like those around them. It wasn't enough that they had God who could part the Red Sea, who could part the waters of the Jordan River, who could create food for years out of nothing and destroy the people around them. It wasn't enough they had God and they had Samuel. They wanted a king. They wanted somebody to lead their armies into battle against the enemies around them. So God gives them a king. His name is Saul. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. That's the smallest of all the tribes, of the 12 tribes of Israel. And he reigns for about 40 years. He, first, you think he's okay. He's tall and handsome. Uh, he looks like a king, but he's kind of timid. He appears to be humble, but he turns out to be arrogant, self-willed, impetuous, paranoid, and disobedient to God. Uh, At about 1040 B.C., David is anointed king in waiting. God doesn't like the way things are going with Saul. And he does a strange thing. He leaves Saul on the throne for another 30 years while David is kind of the king in waiting. And at first, David comes out as a musician, and and Saul doesn't know he... David's been anointed the king in waiting by Samuel. And, 
and Saul's having a lot of problems with God. Spirits that are evil spirits are tormenting him. He's depressed. He's, he's becoming paranoid. He's having lots of all kinds of problems. And so David's one of the musicians that plays music for him and sues him. But he doesn't know, Saul doesn't at first, that David's been chosen by God. And then he finds out and he starts to figure it out. And to make matters worse, the first thing David does to kind of establish his anointing is he goes out and kills this giant who is, and we all know that story from Bible school, uh, who is a uh, uh, from vacation Bible school probably or from Sunday school or Bible classes on Sunday morning as a kid. He kills this giant named Goliath who's the champion of the Philistines and all the nation is gagas over David and Saul gets really jealous and David starts having more and more military victories. Saul becomes more and more jealous. He starts trying to kill David. Eventually David has to flee. And so for about a 10-year period of time, from about 1020 to 1010 B.C., Saul pursues David all over Israel trying to kill him out of jealousy. From about 1015, somewhere about 1015 or maybe even 1012 B.C., Samuel dies and the nation mourns. So he's gone from the scene. About 1010 B.C., there's that tragic scene on Mount Gilboa that I talked about two weeks ago where Saul is fighting the Philistines. Israelites, huge armies are fighting the Philistines, Israelites and Philistines on Mount Gilboa. And Saul is killed. He's actually he's wounded in battle and he kills himself. And three of his sons, including David's best friend, Jonathan, who had protected David from Saul through much of this period of time and warned him when Saul was trying to kill him, he's killed too. So that's the timeline. Now, let me give you some key verses that we've already looked at, but I want to remind you of that highlight some important events before we get to 2 Samuel chapter 9. The first is 1 Samuel 20, verses 15 through 42. This is David making a covenant with Jonathan early on in David's life. Saul is trying to kill him, and Jonathan just loves David. It's kind of odd because Jonathan ought to hate David and be jealous of him too because he's basically stealing his kingship from him. He's the king's son, the oldest, and he should be king. But he loves David and he knows God's anointings on him. So they bond together as best friends. And they make this covenant with one another. And Jonathan seems to know, even early on, that David's going to outlive him. And he says, basically, when I'm dead and gone, because of this kindness I'm going to show you, because I'm going to save you from my father over and over and over, I want you to show the same kind of kindness to my descendants after I'm dead and gone. And basically, they covenant together. Next passage of Scripture, 2 Samuel 3, 1. Just notes that there's a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. It may be referring back to those 10 years when uh, David was running from Saul, but probably not. Probably it's referring to the seven and a half years after that that David is trying to establish his kingship, but he's not, he doesn't have all the territory of Israel yet. And Saul's family, the part that's left after Saul's death and Jonathan's death, a lot of them are resisting him and fighting against him, and he's warring against literally the house of Saul. That lasts about seven and a half years when David's king over part of Israel, but not all of it. And then 2 Samuel 4.4. 4. Right in the middle of another story, the writer just kind of looks ahead and notes Oh, by the way, there's this young man named Mephibosheth who, as his family was fleeing the Philistines right after that Mount Gilboa defeat when his father and his grandfather were killed, somehow he falls or is dropped, probably 10 or 15 feet or something, in the the flight, and he breaks his ankles probably severely, and they don't grow back right, and he's crippled in both feet, and his name is Mephibosheth. He's going to be the main character in today's story. And then 2 Samuel 5, 4 and 5, notes what I've just told you. David's going to reign for about 40 years after Saul's death. About seven and a half is going to be fighting the Philistines to try to gain back all of Israel that Saul lost and also fighting Saul's household. And then for about 33 years, he's going to reign from Jerusalem. But that's a little bit deceiving. We'll look at that later on in a few weeks. He's only going to reign... Part of that 33 years, there's going to be periods of time when he's not on the throne because his own family, some of his own kids are going to turn against him because of a terrible thing that he did, but that's another story for another day. 2 Samuel 7, 15 and 16, Lee talked about this a lot last week. It's called the Davidic Covenant, and we need to pause here and drop anchor. This is where God 
makes a covenant. Now, this is not two men making a covenant. This is God himself making a covenant with David. He's actually reestablishing a covenant he made with a lot of other people centuries before. And we're going to look at at least one of those verses about that covenant, that prophetic covenant. This covenant actually began back there in a garden with a woman and a snake. A woman that had blown it. Her name was Eve. And a snake that represents Satan, the Satan figure in the story and the evil that had, she had given into. And God said something prophetically to the woman and the snake. He said the seed of the woman someday would crush the head of the snake. So this Davidic covenant is going back that far to that garden scene. Let's look at another passage of Scripture. Let me just say that, that the specific Davidic covenant is God saying to David that he, one of his descendants would be on the throne forever, not just of Israel, but he would rule all the nations. Let's go back several hundred years and drop in on a story. Somewhere between the garden and 1000 B.C., there's another story I want to share with you. It's Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. An old man, a famous old man, a famous Bible character by the name of Jacob. He's dying. He's not on his deathbed, but he's about to die. And he calls his 12 famous sons, the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel, they turn out to be, before him. And they're very imperfect people. They're like you and I. They're messes. And one of the biggest messes is this guy named Judah. But for reasons known only to God, he chooses Judah. He's not the oldest. He's not the brightest. He's not even the most moral, but he chooses him. And, and Jacob says, I'm going to tell you, boys, some of the things that are going to happen to you in the future. So he's speaking prophetically. Again, we took a look at the Davidic covenant. Now we're going back to see the roots of the Davidic covenant. And this is what Jacob says to his son Judah. And by the way, David is a descendant of Judah. He says, the scepter will not depart from Judah, meaning the king's scepter, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until it comes to the one it ultimately belongs to. Well, who does it belong to? Who has the right to rule planet Earth? The creator himself. And God assigned it to his son, his one and only son, the second person of the divine trinity, Jesus Christ. And this is speaking prophetically, looking forward to the day that a descendant of Judah. Why is Jesus a descendant of Judah? <laughs> because son of man was his title, his favorite title. Then the man part of him, not the God part of him, is in the lineage of David, who is in the lineage of Judah. He says, this right to rule will come to whom it belongs. And the obedience, not just of Israel, but of all the nations will be his. And let's jump forward now and go past 1000 B.C. And jump to about 700 B.C. And see how the Bible ties together prophetically? And, and, and there's another guy by the name of Daniel. Remember him? He, he in the lion's den. And he's the one that has all the dreams and visions. And a lot of his writings dovetail with visions another guy has are you hanging staying with me in the first century his name is John in the book of Daniel the book of Revelation sometimes there's mirror images of the same thing John will see the same thing in a vision that Daniel saw years before maybe he'll have more context to it but Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 in one of Daniel's night visions this is what he sees in my night vision, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Jesus' favorite title of himself. He kind of looks like a human being, but he's a whole lot more glorified than that. And he's coming. How's he coming? He's riding the clouds of heaven. Jump forward to the first century. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 and 11. Some angels <laughs> standing outside one day talking to some disciples of Jesus. Jesus has been crucified and resurrected. It's been about 40 days. He's kind of hung around on the planet in a glorified body. He appeared to over 500 people. And now he's about to ascend into heaven. And the angels say this prophetically. This Jesus that you see riding those clouds up into heaven will someday come back just like you're seeing him leave. So what Daniel is seeing is that coming back that hasn't happened yet. What John sees in Revelations chapter 1 verse 7 is the exact same thing. 
Let me read the rest of it. Daniel sees this son of man coming, riding the clouds of heaven. And he approaches the ancient of days, God the Father. And he's led into his presence. And what's he given? The king's scepter. Not just over Israel, not just over Hebron, but over the cosmos and over the planet. Authority, glory, sovereign power, all peoples, all nations, men of every language are going to worship him. His dominion, it will be an everlasting dominion in fulfillment of those words spoken and reaffirmed to David in the Davidic covenant. That will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's a full kind of explanation of the Davidic covenant. One more thing I want to know. I counted in a concordance this week, 57 times in the New Testament, Jesus is somehow associated with David. He was born in the same city, the so-called city of David, Bethlehem, that David was born in. Let me read you just one of those 57 passages of Scripture. It's someone by the name of Paul. It's Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Paul writing to a beleaguered, persecuted first century church, a group of Christians in Rome, says this. He always establishes his credentials first. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Let me pause right now and remind you what that gospel is. I've said it sort of standing up here. Let me summarize A woman and a man were put here on a perfect planet. They blew it in a garden a long time ago, deceived by an enemy of God, a fallen and rebellious angel manifesting as a snake. When they blew it in that garden, they passed on to you and me a bent toward sin. We were born with it, folks. The Bible's clear about that. They passed on to us because of their failures a bent toward sin. And every son of Adam and every daughter who have since it's been our law that governs the universe called the law of sin and death. And I didn't write that law, and they didn't write that law, and you may not think that law is right and just, but <laughs> it ain't your universe. It's not mine. And ultimately, God knew that law would require him to manifest himself in some incredible act of sacrificial love. Yeah, it's costly to you and me, but it was really costly to God because he would have to step out of time and eternity about 2,000 years ago in first century Palestine, be born to a virgin teenager by the name of Mary, grow up as a carpenter's son. He was pretty ordinary, unless you really hung out with him, and he was a little different as a kid, I'm sure. At about age 30, he came out, so to speak, as a Jewish rabbi, and established his deity, his right to rule. And he was a little more than just a son of man. By stopping storms, walking on water, raising the dead, healing thousands of people, creating food out of nothing. Those are some of the things he did. And giving and laying forth a powerful ethos, a teaching. He called it his yoke, which he described as easy and light. Then, at about age 33 or 34, he was crucified on a real Roman cross, conspired against by other jealous religious leaders. And he died. After three days, he was resurrected. And after 40 days, he ascended to the Father where he sits on the throne of the universe like David, a king in waiting to the day he will return and set the record straight. That's the gospel. If you embrace that gospel by faith, and that's your only hope of swinging out someday into eternity, standing before a righteous and unholy God, declared justified, and not on your ability to keep rules or do good, but in the blood of Jesus Christ, then you have an incredible inheritance. You get God right now. You get the Holy Spirit right now. And you get eternity with him in a wonderful place. That's the gospel that was Paul was preaching all over southern Europe, northern Africa, and near Asia. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets. I've read you some of those prophecies in Holy Scriptures. The gospel is called in the Old Testament the gracious promise. Regarding his son, who has to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be really of a divine nature, the son of God, by his resurrection from the dead. What's his name? Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Next passage of scripture I want to note, and it's the last one before we get to the text. 2 Samuel 8.15 says this about David. He reigned, generally speaking, righteously and justly. He treated people fairly. He was not an oppressive king like Saul had been. Now, with that backdrop in mind, open your Bible again, if you have not already, to 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm going to read those 13 verses and lightly expose them. We'll talk about it and make some applications. 2 Samuel chapter 9. David says, he's sitting on the throne again. He's in Jerusalem. The kingdoms and the enemies have been conquered. He's settling in his king. And he says this. He's remembering a covenant he made with an old friend. He says, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Again, the word is hased, that I can show extreme kindness or gracious mercy because of my covenant with Jonathan. He's a covenant-keeping guy. Now, there was a servant of Saul's household, this guy named Ziba. He says, go get Ziba. Are you Ziba? I am. Your servant, he replies. He's an interesting character. He'll reappear in the story later. The king says, is there no one still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show? Now he describes his words said a little differently. God's kindness. God's gracious favor that I can bestow blessing on like God does. Ziba answers, there is still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in both feet. Where is he, the king asked. Ziba answered, he's the house of this guy named Maker, son of some other guy named Amelia, in this place called Lodabar. That literally means land of no pastures. He's hiding in the wilderness in exile, probably afraid David will kill him if he finds out there's still one of Saul's descendants left. Verse 5, King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Maker, son of Amiel. And when, when, when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, really the grandson of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. And David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied, don't be afraid. This kid's probably terrified. David said to him, for I will surely show you, I said, for the sake of your father, Jonathan, let me spell out for you what I'm going to do to you and for you. First of all, I'm going to give you all of your grandfather's lands. That's a lot, folks. That's all of Saul's properties. He's taken them. He says, I'm going to give them to you. And furthermore, you're going to always eat at my table. I'm going to have fellowship with you like you're one of my own sons. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Now, he's got low self-esteem, I know, and you want to send him to counseling and all that stuff. But the point, this is a theological term. It has rich theological meaning. We'll look at it in just a few minutes. Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, Okay, I just gave all your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. I'm bestowing extreme blessings on him, and I want you and all your sons, he's got a whole bunch of them apparently, and all your servants, he's probably pretty wealthy, Ziba is. I want you guys to farm the land for him and take care of him. I'm sure Ziba got paid well. Then Ziba said to the king, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. And so it says again, it notes again, so Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. He's been adopted by the king. And Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. Now that's just thrown in here to let you know that this covenant-keeping king is going to allow Jonathan's line, his descendants, to continue just like Jonathan had asked. And all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem. But it says for the fourth time, he always ate at the king's table. Always. Daily. Every day. He had fellowship with the king. And he was crippled. Even though he was crippled. Even though he was broken in both feet. Thoughts and comments on the text. Some of this is going to be repetitious. Again, Hased, extreme kindness, God's grace. David received Hased from Jonathan earlier in his life. He's now extending it to Jonathan's son. Based on 2 Samuel 9, 3, one of those verses I read, David seems to be aware of something else here. He seems to be aware of some moral duty as king to dispense God's kindness. Not just because of Jonathan, but because David 
has received kindness from God and he's now in a position to dispense it. Do you get the application? Just as we have received grace from God, we have a duty to extend that grace to others around us on a daily basis. And when we treat other people like trash, regardless if they're our enemies or if they have flaws in themselves, we're not being grace dispensers. We're not exuding a character quality of daddy. Ziba, well, actually he's a duplicious character who will reappear later in the story, but I won't tell you that now. It won't be in a good light. Lo Debar again means place with no pasture. Again, Mephibosheth was likely living in exile, hiding in the desert of town, afraid of David. Mephibosheth literally means broken shame. That was not his birth name. We know from 1 Chronicles 8, 34, that his birth name meant Merah Baal, fighter of Baal, a fighter of foreign gods. People that were disabled in that time were considered a burden. And even today in many cultures, disability is associated with shame. Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth's reference to himself as a dead dog reflects that view. But again, the term has deep theological and allegorical meanings I'll go into later. The cultural response in David's day would have been for the new king that took the throne by force to kill all of the descendants, even if they didn't oppose him with the old king, all the males at least. God had previously allowed David to take Saul's lands. We learned that in another chapter, 2 Samuel 12, 8. That's why he's able to give them back to Mephibosheth. The phrase, eat at my table, again, appears four times in the chapter, verses 7, 10, 11, and 13. That is the theme of the text. That is the question for the morning. Will you come to the table again? There is a standing invitation by God to come and have fellowship with him daily and to feed our souls with what brings life. Next thing I note, this whole war between the house of Saul from the tribe of Benjamin and the house of David from the tribe of Judah was all about establishing a dynasty, a succession of rulers from one family line. When David tells Mephibosheth in verse 7, do not fear. You need to know if you hadn't figured it out already. That's one of the most common promises given in the Bible or commands in the Bible is do not fear. It often precedes an incredible promise like Joshua 1 9, that I will be with you. Don't be afraid, Joshua. I will be with you wherever you go. Let me read to you. It, it appears over and over and over. One of the times it appears because it relates to the story this morning. It's a very famous passage of scripture. It's actually a passage of scripture <laughs> I memorized when I was four years old. It's Luke chapter 2, it's the Christmas story. And this is an angel that appears to a group of shepherds outside the city of David where Jesus Christ was born and David had been born, Bethlehem. And they're keeping the sheep by night as the story goes. And now this angel already has several thousand other angels probably with him. So these shepherds are like freaked out. That would be pretty common to say to them, don't be afraid, guys. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. I bring you incredible news. News of great joy. It ought to make you jump up and down and shout. The Messiah has been born. He's been born in David's city in the town of David. A Savior has been born to you. And he is Christ the Lord. One of the times that do not be afraid appears later on in the story. It's a gospel allegory. The story that I've just read to you is a whole lot more than just a story about David being graciously kind to a disabled young man because his deceased father helped him earlier in life. Like many stories in the Old Testament, it points forward to future events. It is a prophetic foreshadowing, if you will, a real-life prophetic allegory, a gospel allegory. In case you happen to have one of those brains that God gave you that does real well with computers and math and accounting but doesn't do real with allegory and metaphor, let me spell it out to you. Saul in the story is like Adam and Eve in the bigger story 
whose moral failures cause devastating consequences for their descendants. They, 1 Peter 1, 7 says that Christ redeemed us from an empty or a futile way of life handed down to us by our ancestors. David says that in Psalm 51, 5, that he was sinful from birth. So were you and so was I. After that sin in the garden, we inherited, as I've said earlier, and the Bible bears it out, a bent towards sin. We are casualties of our ancestors' failures. Saul or Adam and Eve in the bigger story. David. David is like God the Father in this allegory. He's sitting on the throne and has the resources to dispense hased or mercy. Jonathan, not David, at least in this story, is the Christ figure. We, who are we in the story? We're humanity, the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, but who are we in this gospel allegory? We're Mephibosheth. We are. Again, like Mephibosheth, we're casualties of our ancestors' failures. Second thing you need to hear in this gospel allegory, we were spiritually dead dogs at one time, like Mephibosheth described himself. And God graciously chose to breathe life into us. Let me read to you something that I don't fully understand all this, but it's very clear from Scripture that it's so. Ephesians 2, 1, 4, and 5 says this. Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, and he's writing to you and I, as for you, Jim, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Dead. Verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in said in mercy, that's a character quality of God. He made you alive. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by what you've been saved, by your own intelligence, by your own ability to do good and not bad, by your own ability to beat your bench towards sin. No, it is by grace you have been saved. Undeserved favor, kindness shown by God. Third thing I would note in this gospel allegory, we're all fallen and broken spiritually. Like Mephibosheth was broken physically. We have no power to save ourselves. Romans 3.23 says, We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. A glory that he bestowed on Adam and Eve in the garden that he intended for you and I to have. And we've lost it. We've lost that glory. Fourth thing I would note, it, like Mephibosheth, we are all, and here's where it gets to be, a whosoever will faith. We are all invited and pursued by the king. John 3, 16 and 17. At least one of those verses you probably memorized as a kid. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. One more Jesus story that relates to this gospel allegory. It's from Luke 14, 21, a story that Jesus told to help us understand. We're the poor, the crippled, the blind, that the rich man graciously invites to his banquet table, according to Jesus. Fifth thing I would note about this gospel allegory, like Mephibosheth, we aren't just invited to someday be with the king. We're invited to have fellowship daily with Jesus Christ and his Father. And as the Westminster Confession says, to enjoy God forever. That's what it's about. Sixth thing I would note from this gospel allegory. As Mephibosheth was given lands and crops, we have been given an eternal inheritance in heaven. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like. John 14, 1 through 3 says this. That Jesus went to heaven to prepare a place for you and I so that we could be with him forever. And we've been given a down payment on that inheritance. And maybe you aren't as aware as you should be of that down payment. The same spirit of the living God that raised Jesus from the dead 
If you really know him, you have access to that spirit. It's inside of you. That's the down payment of your inheritance. The last thing I would note, like Mephibosheth, we can't afford the king's food. It's too costly. We can't pay for it. We've got no resources. We don't have the moral capital to buy it. But he doesn't ask us anything in return but to accept his gift and enjoy his fellowship. Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. Again, speaking prophetically and looking forward, written about 700 years before those angels would appear to those shepherds outside of David's city to announce that the Messiah had been born to a teenage girl named Mary. Isaiah says this, Come, come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, you who have no money, you who are bankrupt morally and can't buy what's being offered you, come, buy it and eat. Come buy wine and milk, Jim, without money and without cost to you personally. Why, Jim? Why spend your resources for the 70 or 80 years you have on this planet? Why spend your time, talents, possessions, and influence? Why do you waste them on things that have no eternal significance? Things that will never satisfy you. That's verse 2. That's why spend your resources on what does not satisfy. Isaiah says, listen. Listen to me. And eat what is good, what is eternal, what has eternal significance. And then, Jim, as Jesus said when he was asked by the disciples one day at a well, why, don't you, why aren't you hungry? He said, I have food to eat that you know not of. This is the food he was talking about. Fellowship with the king. He said, your soul, Jim, will then delight in the richest affair. That literally means extremely expensive food. How expensive? This grace was bought with the most precious gift in all the universe. It was bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, God's own blood, paid for you and me and gave us the right and the privilege to sit at his table daily and feast on his grace and mercy. That was written about 2,700 years ago by a prophet by the name of Isaiah. Conclusions and applications. It's kind of a spiritual dud, isn't it? Have you accepted God's invitation to the banquet to have food, drink, and fellowship with the king, it's not a one-time thing. Like Lee said last week again, it's a whole lot more exciting than winning the lottery. It is. Think about it. Eternal life in a wonderful place with a wonderful God forever. And not only that, fellowship with him daily, even while living in the midst of this broken and sin-cursed planet. The question again is, will you come to the table? Will you come to the table? Now, if you've never admitted your brokenness, the culture tells us, you're not broken. Baloney, you're broken. You're messed up. <laughs> you're a mess. I know most of you. And you know me, and I'm a mess too. We're broken people. We're sinners in need of a Savior. As unpopular as it is to say that. Have you accepted God's invitation to come to the table, to the party, through Jesus? You can do it today. Again, the gospel of Jesus Christ. With the risk of being extremely redundant, 2,000 years ago, God came to the planet disguised as Mary's baby boy, lived a perfect sinless life, and about age 33, offered himself up as a sin sacrifice for you and me. And if we embrace that truth by faith, then we get these things that I've talked about now for about 35 minutes. You know, we get to come to the table, and we get fellowship with God the gospel of Jesus Christ. He asks you to make a public statement if you've never done it of your acceptance by confessing him publicly and by being baptized. As the young lady did, I think I can pronounce her name, Laordis, a few minutes ago so eloquently that she demonstrated her faith. And you can do that this morning if you've never done it or if you want to do it again. Demonstrate your faith by coming and being baptized. We do that spontaneously. Lots of folks have at New Heights Church. Just see a member of their prayer team. If you've already accepted his invitation, the invitation still stands on a daily basis. Are you feasting on the grace of God? 
communing with him daily. Again, will you come to the table? Mephibosheth never loses his deep appreciation for what the king had done for him. Late in his life, when he's very old, he says this, 2 Samuel 19, 28. He says, all of my grandfather's descendants and all of yours deserve nothing but death from my Lord the king. But you gave your servant a place among those who eat at your table. What deep, rich theological statement that is. Someday Jesus is going to completely fulfill the rest of that gracious promise and those prophetic utterances. And he's going to sit literally on David's throne and we'll see him visibly. He says this, the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, this is what Jesus says in one of those visions to his son, to his friend John. He says, I am the root and the offspring of David. What does that mean? The root means he's the source of David's life. He existed before David. All life comes from him. I'm the root of David. And not only that, I'm son of man as well as son of God. I'm the offspring of David. He said, I'm the bright and the morning star. The way John described him as the light of the world. And then he goes on to say, I'm coming back soon. I'm coming back soon. Riding in those clouds, those angels saw him ascend to heaven in. Someday he's coming. He's going to split the eastern sky. He's going to come riding in. He's going to come riding in slowly because all the world, it says in Revelation, and I have time to note his coming. Looking to claim as his own. All who have accepted his invitation to the party. There's a line from a Christian song from a few years back. It's kind of artistic, but it captures the thought of this idea of the king inviting us to his table. It goes like this. Just think of Jesus saying this to you. Jim, you bring all your history, all your junk. You bring all your history, and I'll bring the bread and the wine. And we'll have ourselves a party. And all the drinks are on me. And as surely as the rising sun, you will be set free. That's the gospel according to the Bible in 2 Samuel chapter 9. We're going to do this morning what Christians have been doing for years. <laughs> We're going to have a communion. We do it as the first century church did every Sunday to remember his death until he comes back, his sacrificial and atoning death. It's available around the room. Take it with someone if you can. We have a baptistry set up here. Again, I invite you to be baptized if you have not been or you want to be this morning. We can do that right now. And then there's the prayer team. Prayer team, come on up. They're available around the room to pray for you. If you want prayer for any reason, or if the Spirit's telling you you go pray for someone that's a total stranger, go do it. This is a ministry time. It's for you. And there, we're going to have another opportunity right now to stand and engage this soon-coming king in worship. Let's take that opportunity in worship.